Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of life, the gift of song, the gift of faith for all ages. And Lord, as we look into your word now, I, um, I confess that uh, your word challenges me, and it encourages me, but it challenges me. And Lord, I pray that as a result of our looking into your word today and hearing a personal testimony of stepping out in faith and uh, trusting you at your word, that we will all be not only challenged, but inspired to receive the things that you already offer to us and the things that you want to give us, but then also as we receive them that we would be willing to put them into practice for your glory and for your kingdom and for the good of others. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the many Bible passages that challenges me to think about my faith in Christ and how to live that out is in Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 through 9. And it's an account of when Jesus sent out his 12 closest followers for the very first time uh, to the Jewish nation so that they could experience what it would be like to live under Christ's kingdom rule. And in verse 1, it says this in Matthew 10. And he, Jesus, called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The original Greek word there in the text uh, that's translated into English as authority is exousia, and it literally means authority that's delegated, but it also means power. So it carries with it both of those ideas, authority and power. On our own, none of us have the ability to cast out an unclean spirit or a demonic spirit. And sometimes we think of those demonic spirits um, as just a tendency or a bent towards some unhealthy behaviors. And, you know, sometimes people use that as a metaphor. They say, yeah, you know, that person has their demons. But, and they don't literally, I don't think they think of it as a possession of an evil type spirit or an unclean, unhealthy type spirit. But the scripture clearly teaches about demons and from what we can gather from our study of the scriptures, demons are angelic beings that followed Satan's leading to rebel against God, to reject him, and to try to set up their own powerful kingdom. And they are not as powerful as God, and so they were cast out of heaven and, and out of God's presence. And so that's what we refer to as demons today. Um, I believe demons are real because the Bible teaches that they are real. And what challenges me as I read this passage is that Jesus gave his closest followers authority over those demonic spirits. He gave his disciples power over sickness and over disease, just as he himself had the power to speak the word and a person became well. Now this is where this challenges me, and I I'll be surprised if I'm alone in this. I have never experienced in my life that I know of the power to cast out a demonic spirit, though I have prayed in the name of Jesus and by the power and authority of Jesus to bind up Satan and to cast him away from people and out of people's lives. For some of you, that might make you feel really uncomfortable or strange, but I'm being honest with you because this is why I say this challenges me and my faith and how am I really living it out? Do I really believe this? And if so, how am I operating under it? And certainly when I pray for someone to get well, I know there's no power in me to do that, but I believe in the power of Christ to heal. Amen. And so when I pray, I ask his power, and that's what I do when I pray about binding up demonic spirits or uh, for any of these types of things. I pray in his name and by his power that he's the one that does it. I'm simply a servant, a vessel. I'm calling upon his power and authority. And yet there are times with many, many funerals that I've done, the thought crosses my mind, 
and, and of course, when you're at the funeral service, there's a period of time that's passed and all these things that I won't get into. But these thoughts go through my mind. It's like, Lord, you know, when you were here, you never, you never conducted one funeral service. You conducted resurrections. Isn't that awesome? You have the power to give new life. And so I confess there are times that though I know Christ has this power, there are times that my faith, I believe, is so weak because I think, well, Lord, you have the power, but, but what can I do? And what this scripture tells us is that God does, in his wisdom and by his discernment, give us power and authority, even over things that we would normally not be able to do because he's the one that's doing it through us, his power, his spirit. And that challenges me. Because that means there are times that maybe I might need to take a risk. And I might need to have that extra step of faith to, to pray in a way I haven't prayed before. Not only silently, but out loud with someone. And not trusting my power, but trusting the power of Christ. So I'm being very vulnerable with you here today. But here's the good news in this. And really, it's all good news. But what I'm saying is, I don't use sometimes my fear or lack of faith to cause me to not pray and to not ask God for things. I'm going to pray and ask for his power, his healing, his will to be done, and then I will leave the results up to him. But think about his disciples, his closest 12 disciples. He told them, I am specifically giving you my power and my authority that in the same way that you have seen me raise the dead and heal diseases, every disease, I'm now entrusting you with that power and I want you to go out. And so a little bit later on in Matthew chapter 10, after he tells them this and gives them this authority, he says this in verses 7 through 8, and as you go, preach or proclaim. He wasn't telling them, come up with a three-point sermon or some kind of an outline, he says, just proclaim this, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now stop and think about that. If Jesus sent his followers, his disciples, to go out with his power and to cast out demonic spirits so that people could be set free and live the kind of life that they want to live that would honor Christ, be set free from their unhealthy habits and attitudes and, and oppression that's in their life, if they could be set free from those influences to, to be the people that God had created them to be, if, if he gave them the power to speak a word and pray and people would literally become well again from their diseases, not perfectly healthy, wouldn't that be an awesome world? And, well, that is a picture of God's kingdom. That's what Jesus said. I'm giving you this power and authority, and I want you to experience what it would be like to live, what it is like to live in my kingdom. So I'm giving you my power. Now you go out, and I want you to use this power to bless everybody and proclaim to them the kingdom of heaven is near, at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead cast out demons and then he said this freely you have received freely give i want us all to think about and be challenged with the authority that christ has given to each one of us but i pray that this message won't discourage you i pray instead it will encourage you and inspire you to whatever it is that God has gifted you to do, whatever power, authority, things that he has given you by the power of his spirit that didn't cost you a thing, it's a gift that he's given you, just like salvation is a gift. Forgiveness of sin is a gift from God. We didn't do a thing to earn it. In fact, we don't deserve it. That's what grace is, undeserved favor. But because of his love, he offers us this gift of forgiveness. But even beyond that, the scripture tells us that God gives us spiritual gifts or abilities that don't come naturally to us. There are some abilities we have that we're born, as we're born and we mature, certain things that we tend to be good at. And, and really everything is a gift from God. Our very life is a gift from God. So natural abilities are a gift from God, but then there's something that he does in a supernatural way. And this is the part that oftentimes in churches, we, we just want to get comfortable. We don't like to be challenged with our faith or our belief in God. That's what happened to the Jewish nation 
when Christ came and walked right among them and was doing all this miraculous things, it threatened them because they saw what power they did not have and what power he had and they felt threatened. So in the church, we need to be careful if we're threatened by seeing the mighty miraculous power of God at work because that's who he is. He works in the natural and he works in the supernatural. So when you truly pray and invite Christ to come into your life, and you ask him to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you. And literally, if you pray and say, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my savior. I want you to come into my soul, my spirit. I want you to fill me with your power. Help me to live for you, because that really is what repentance is. Repentance isn't just this one time little magical phrase that you use and all of a sudden you become a Christian. Repentance is a change of mind, a change of heart, and and it, it is a lifestyle. It's, it's a decision that you make every day, not to try harder, but just to say, Lord, I want to go your way and not my way. Help me to keep learning and growing. Fill me with your power. Help me to stay in the direction you want me to go. That's what really true repentance is. But anyway, he gives us special spiritual gifts when we pray and invite Christ into our life. In fact, the scripture tells us this. Well, in James chapter 1, verse 17, it says this. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. That means that the same God who gifted his followers in Christ's day to have power and authority to make a difference in the world He doesn't change. So today, I do believe he still gives us spiritual gifts and abilities, but they do vary, and that's what the scripture says. In Ephesians chapter four, verse seven, it says this, but to each one of us, grace has been given. I think, see if I got that slide up there, Richard. I'm not sure if I put that in there. Ephesians four, seven, did I get that in there? To each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. It doesn't say to some of us who have trusted Christ. It doesn't say to a special few that deserve it or tried harder. It says to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. My question to you is, have you received that grace? Then verse eight focuses on what we're supposed to do. Jesus said, freely you have received, now freely give. Be willing to offer it, step out in faith. In Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, it says this, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So what we learn from other New Testament passages is not everybody has the same gifts of the spirit or power to do certain things, but we all have been given an authority by Jesus Christ, by which we can operate and use those gifts. It is his power, not ours. And we've done nothing to, re- to believe or to receive that or to earn it, I guess I should say. But we simply receive it as he has given it. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 11, it says this. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Here it is again in verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Freely we have been given. Freely you have been given. Freely give. Freely share. Freely use. Willingly use what God has empowered you to do for the good of the church, for the good of your community, because that's when people begin to see the kingdom of God at work in its many different ways. Paul goes on and he writes after he says, at each one, to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. He says, to one there is given uh, the Spirit, by the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. There it is. God today still gives the gift of healing through certain individuals, though all healing comes from God. To another, miraculous powers. There it is. Well, what would be a miraculous power? It would be somebody that is sick and dying would get well, amazingly. The doctors can't explain it. It would be that if somebody even died, 
they would be brought back to life. Now there are some of you here that might be skeptical about that because maybe some of you might think, well, I've never heard of anybody being prayed for and come back to life. Actually, I heard of two stories personally by individuals that I know um, that there were incidences and in different occasions, different circumstances where an individual had died and people prayed for that individual and they literally came back to life. Why don't we hear about that in the news? Well, because if people heard that today, they'd say, well, that's fake news, right? <laughs> we hear a lot about fake news now in the media. And, and so we all have this kind of skepticism, but that's a barrier to keep us from freely receiving what God has given us and how he wants us to empower, uh, or how he empowers us to work in the world. And, and this challenges me, because I think, Lord, what is it that you've given me authority and power to do that I haven't even maybe either been willing to receive or willing to put it to practice in my life. So he goes on and he says, after uh, miraculous powers, he says, to another is given prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still an interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determined. So it goes back to what he said earlier. Every single one of us is given a gift. The question is, number one, are you willing to receive what it is that he wants to freely give you? And then number two, then are you willing to freely give and to serve him? And so finally, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, another apostle, Peter, who received this power, writes to followers in Christ, and he says, as each has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So the scripture tells us that not everybody has the same spiritual gifts, but we all have at least one gift or some type of gift and sometimes multiple gifts that God wants us to use. You've done nothing to earn it or deserve it. It's been offered to you freely given. And so Jesus says, I just simply want you by faith to freely give it, put it into practice. Don't hold it back but freely offer it and use it. So this morning, uh, as part of a living sermon illustration, we have Megan George, who is part of this church, a young lady um, who has been growing in her faith, and she had the opportunity to go on a mission trip with a sister church in our area, South Parkersburg Baptist Church, and they went to Bolivia. And so she stepped out in faith and really is kind of putting what I just shared with you into practice, saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to just be willing to use what you've given me to do, and I want to share it with others. So, Megan, will you come on up, please, right now, and uh, help Megan to feel welcome as she comes up, put her at ease. So, this is Megan. And she's going to use most of the remainder of the time to talk uh, about her trip, and she's got a lot of pictures to share. And I do want you to know, by the way, that we did support her on this trip, our mission committee, and uh, so we're excited to have you share with us, Megan. Thank you. Good morning. Before I tell you a little bit about my trip, I'd like to talk to you all about the experience leading up to it. For several months before I was asked to go on the trip, I would pray daily that God would give me direction in life. Place me where I'm needed. I had struggled with my reason and where I belong and what I'm supposed to do. Although I prayed for direction, I accepted that God has a plan for me. Mission trips were something I have always felt a need to do. Three months prior to the trip, I got a call from my aunt asking if I'd be interested in going to Bolivia with a medical team from her church. Without hesitation, I said yes. As soon as I got off the phone with her, I was instantly filled with tears of joy and relief. God called me to this mission and I had to answer it without a doubt. Within the week, we met up to start talking expenses and how I would benefit the team. She had recently found out there would be dentists joining us for a couple clinics, and she felt I'd be a large asset to the dental team as I am a dental assistant, and I would be able to utilize my career accomplishments. And like most, I didn't have a year to prepare for this trip. I had two months. I had to expedite a passport, get vaccinations, costs for stay, airfare, visa, and that was just a small portion of what I needed. 
For 10 days, I traveled with a group from South Parkersburg Baptist Church, 12 women. It was a diverse group, all ages, um, different churches, and even different religions. But we all meshed well, came together for one reason, and we left each other with forever friendships. Along with 11 other ladies, we were thrilled to be providing medical and dental treatments to the underserved areas in Cochabamba, Bolivia. You can start the slides. <laughs> Upon arrival, we had a couple of days of downtime. We used that time for resting, adjusting to the altitude, fellowship, packing vitamins, vet, uh, medications, toothbrushes and toothpaste, clothing and shoes for the clinics. There were things to get adjusted to, the altitude and the amenities. Cochabamba is 9,000 feet um, above sea level. For five days, we took altitude sickness medication and drank cocoa tea so the altitude would not make us sick. Aside from the headaches, tingling of our hands and feet, none of us got sick and we all adjusted well. Although our home was beautiful, the amenities were not. There were no hot showers. We we're not allowed to drink the water or use the water to brush our teeth. We weren't allowed to flush the toilet paper down the toilet. And for dishes, we had to boil water before we could um, do the dishes. It was kind of like camping. <laughs> um, let's see. And this picture right here, this is um, a picture of us like packing the vitamins. Um, before we could go on clinics, we would um, pack uh, 30 days of vitamins for the children. And then we would go through all the antibiotics and... Um, we also pack the toothbrush and toothpaste as we give those out every day to the kids. You can go on the next slide. All right, our team, um, it stayed, we stayed at the House of Hope in uh, Cochabamba. Carmen, Richard, and their three daughters hosted us and welcomed us with open arms, and they made us feel right at home. The House of Hope is a ministry that serves the needs of women, children, pastors, and families. The dedication is amazing. It's like a well-oiled machine. That's what we'd say every day. <laughs> um, they coordinate more than 70 different ministries in Cochabamba area, working with children, handicapped children, um, feeding malnourished neighborhoods, providing medical needs, and bathing babies and s who live in some of the impoverished parts of Cochabamba. For this medical trip, we had four days of clinics in four different areas. Okay, next slide. Day one, um, we went to a uh, church called Kalama in downtown Cochabamba. We met with uh, four doctors and two dentists. While we were there, we treated around 80 people. Um, we provided medical and dental needs uh, to kids of all ages and several adults. Kalama Church opens to the public Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to feed the homeless. Most hear about it by word of mouth. On this day, I was able to assist a dentist and sterilize instruments. In this picture, and it's just soap and water, and then you rinse the instruments. It's very different, but it was an amazing experience. And that little, looks like a suitcase, and is actually the operatory, and you just pack it all up and roll it away. It's very different. <laughs> um, for any treatments, there was no local anesthetic that was used, and the kids and adults um, sat through all the procedures calmly. You can go on the next slide. All right. And, um, most days, we did not um, see any men as they were out working because um, the women did not work. So we saw a lot of just women and children. But this day, we saw quite a few men that were able to come in and get some um, work done. And these are pictures. This, there's a little boy there. He was uh, two years old. He had two teeth pulled. Um, they were infected, and he sat there calmly, and you just, we just take so much for granted, and um, it was just amazing to watch him just sit there through all of that without even budging. I mean, he just sat there like a trooper. We loved him.
Sorry, I'm trying to let the pictures catch up. I have a lot of pictures. <laughs> um, most of the women, they wore hats and these really pretty skirts. Um, and they all dressed alike, which was really awesome. And they all had, they're all colorful. Um, and they wore their babies on the back of their um, outfits. It was like a blanket. And they'd tie them around, and they would walk miles at a time just carrying these kids on their back. It was amazing. So on day two, um, which is showing right now, we, tra we traveled up to the mountain to a village called Mount Sinai. Uh, we set up a clinic at a local church in the village. We treated around 65 kids and 20 or so women. This is the church. It's kind of like a cob building. That's uh, what they called it. It's mud and straw. On this day, there were only doctors, so we helped the medical. Um, we helped with medical attention and entertained the children while the mothers were being treated. Most families were mothers um, with four to six children, so entertainment was necessary. We learned to play duck, duck, goose. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, this picture shown right here. Um, there was a family that came through that had a lamb, and he uh, followed them everywhere. And we first saw him outside with the little girl, and we were in all over him, and then he trots right in with her. <laughs> and um, he was their pet, and he just he hung out. He didn't make a noise. Um, it was just really cute to kind of see this little girl and the lamb walking around everywhere. You can go to the next slide. All right. Um, sorry, I lost my spot. Um, there was also one particularly um, special case. Um, one, uh, one lady was complaining um, that her ear was bothering her. They checked it out and noticed there's a lot of uh, wax buildup. So as they were flushing her ear, they had found a dead cockroach in her ear. And the picture will come up soon. This is her little boy. <laughs> Um, so after much flushing, here it is, um, after much flushing, the wax built up and the cockroach was removed. You can go to the next slide. Um, it was just, it just kind of, that picture in particular just kind of shows um, the living conditions. Um, you know, they're homeless, they live on the grounds, their um, houses are... Like there's one house, it was just, you know, a piece of wood and maybe some tarp. And it just kind of goes to show the living conditions of that area. Um, we also, um, uh, there was a, a family in the village and they fed us um, lunch that day. And it's very common to um, just eat soup, which is like chicken broth, some rice, chives, and a potato. Um, and it was a really good experience to go to a house and see how they lived and uh, how they ate. That picture right there is their grocery store. Um, you just walk up to the window, ask what you need, and they give it to you. We needed batteries that day. And we went up there to see if they had them, and they had them. <laughs> um, so. And then the beginning of every day, we'd pray with the ministries and the doctors and the dentists. Um, the way the clinic set up, there was uh, four different um, spots. There was, um, the, you'd get your name, um, your age, and the vitals, and then you'd get some blood work and a urine sample, and then you'd go see the nurse, tell them about your problems, and then they'd go and see whichever doctor was available. And then after that, um, they would go and they would see uh, the pharmacist, which that's where they would get their vitamins and their medications if they needed treated. On day three, you can go ahead and slide, um, we traveled midway up the mountain to a place called Kumi. Uh, Kumi was a foundation that was started by um, a single mother that has eight children. Um, this lady made the impossible possible. Um, <laughs> Just hours before we arrived, she was released from the hospital as she was battling uh, pancreatitis. But she was there just in time for the kids' arrival and to take care of them and make sure they had everything they needed before they were going off to school. Here she was, um, um, we provided medical care, they entertained the children and did lots of collaring. Originally, this foundation was um, for mentally and physically handicapped children. 
but now it's turned to a place uh, for the poor children to come to. While we were there, um, while they were there, they do their homework, um, they play, and they get fed, and most of the um, food they get fed is just a piece of bread and water, and they're very thankful for that because a lot of these kids were um, malnourished, and um, just to see them be so thankful for this little piece of bread was just, it was just amazing. Um, and weeks before us, as you saw in the pictures, there was a mission team that had come in and they had just completed the, back, or the playground in the back. And um, that was really cool to see that because it was actually a team that they had known. So it was kind of cool to see that. So on day four, um, we traveled to a place called Emmanuel Foundation located in downtown Cochabamba. Gretti, who leads the foundation, is Bolivia. Um, before starting her foundation, she worked in Germany for several years as an engineer. When we came back and started, when she came back and started up her foundation, a church that she attended to in Germany fully funded her foundation, which is really awesome for um, a foundation in Bolivia. And also, she has a bus business, and for eighty dollars a day, um, she'll transport you wherever you need to go. And so she transported us to all of our clinics and anywhere if we needed to go to the store or when we went to visit the city. Um, and while we were there, she would stay with us at the clinics, um, help us every day, and then she would go back and take over care of the kids in the evening. Um, this was our biggest day and for me the most emotional and rewarding day. Um, as we arrived, 40 to 50 kids would just come running up to you with open arms and ready for hugs and kisses. Um, most of the kids' mothers were prostitutes, and the rest were homeless. On this day, um, it was just me and four dentists, so it was a long, busy day, but it was really rewarding. Um, as well as four doctors provide the medical care, and not only were they um, there for medical and dental needs, but we were there to provide love for these children. Um, and you could tell it was something they lacked in their lives, so it was really awesome to just be there, love them, hug them, play with them, and just do whatever they wanted us to do. <laughs> Um, and again, these groups of kids, they were so well-mannered, and we treated about 80 kids on this day. And then um, on day five, um, which you kind of saw a little bit of them, we took um, the day to tour the city. We were supposed to have a clinic, but it ended up getting um, canceled. Um, nearly no pictures were taken because we weren't allowed to have our phones out. People would try to see them. And ending the day, we went to see the Cristo. And for those of you who do not know what that is, it is the statue of Jesus Christ in Cochabamba, which you had saw in the, um, at the end. And in front of the statue, there's a Bible that lies open with a scripture from John 14, 6 that reads, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth of life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. In the evening, we had dinner, a worship fellowship with all the doctors, dentists, and pastors, and missionaries we worked with through the week. Um, to say I'm humble would be an understatement. Pictures do not show my experience justice. We as Americans take so much for granted, and this trip has forever changed my heart. I would like to first and foremost thank all those who supported me, my family, the church, my church family, friends, and some I barely know. Without you all, I would not have had this experience. And most of all, the prayers were heard and answered. Sorry. <laughs> I am so grateful God was able to use, my, use me, my kindness to give, and my career accomplishments. I thought going over there, I would witness the people who did not know or believe God. But that was just the opposite. If anything, they've taught me so much. To pray more, you can never pray too much, love each other more, and never take anything for granted. Never be afraid, never be afraid to get involved and volunteer, and most of all, accept that God is in control and he has amazing things in store for each one of us. Young, old, rich, or poor, we are all brothers and sisters of Christ, and take um, what God has given us and use it to the fullest. 
I hope my experience and my story can inspire you to get involved and know you too will be rewarded and blessed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bless you. Isn't that great? You see why I wanted you to, to hear her story. Um, the difference between giving what you have and giving what you have received really is the difference between how the two kingdoms operate, the kingdom of the world versus the kingdom of Christ. Because giving what you have focuses on your talents, your abilities, your wealth. That's the starting point, what you have. So you bring not only your resources, um, uh, but your experiences. But that can really result in ineffectiveness because, again, it's focusing on what we have. And what I want you to hear from this message today, remember what Jesus said. He gave them power and authority that they did not have prior to the moment that he gave them that power and authority. They could not heal people, but after he gave them that power, they could heal people. They received that power that they did not have, they freely received it, and then they freely went out and shared it. And with it, they proclaimed the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of Christ is at hand. When Megan got this desire in her heart that God put in her heart to go on this trip, and I love that you said this at the end because it illustrates my point. Did you, I, I, this is a rhetorical question, you don't have to answer it. Did you have the money and the resources to go on this trip when the, the thought first entered your mind? And, and the, question, or the answer to that is no. But what she did was in faith, she said, Lord, if you want me to do this, I'm willing to receive you know, whatever it is that you want me to have, I'll, I'll trust you. And then she asked. And we shared in that. Again, God moved our hearts to freely share what we had received from God as a church, not only financially, but with prayers, with grace, with with encouragement, with all those gifts that he gives us through his spirit. And we offered that to Megan and she received it. She freely received it. And then she had the resources and she went and she freely gave to those who didn't have the resources, the poor. So this is what a picture of the kingdom of God is like. So as we close this morning, I just want you to consider this and it really is a question that we each need to think about because it's between you and God. It's not for me to determine what your gift or your power is. It's up to Christ. Remember, the scripture says that Christ determines the authority and the power that he gives us. But I would ask you this, what have you received from Christ that you can offer to others? And I do want you to consider that God does offer, Christ offers every single one of us authority. And he does offer to every single one of us abilities. And he does offer to every single one of us a ministry, a service, something that he wants us to do for his kingdom to bless others. And then he has also given us a message. And that message is God's kingdom is at hand. Through the power of Christ's spirit, Christ offers his presence in our lives. That is good news because there is a lot of bad stuff in the world, but God offers his presence through Jesus Christ to bring light into our darkness of our own personal life, but also then as we freely receive his forgiveness, his grace, the things that he wants us to do, he gives us an opportunity to freely share that with others. So this morning as we close, we're going to sing a couple of songs uh, just to send us off, and, and I want you to think about uh, what you've heard today. But I want to do something a little bit different, and uh, this is not about trying to work people up into an emotional state or anything. Um, sometimes we get excited, sometimes we're just kind of easy going. But it doesn't change the fact that God offers gifts to each single one of us. And if you're here this morning, and maybe you're not even sure what it is that, that, that you've received or what gift you have, then I invite you to, to come forward as we sing this song and pray. 
And uh, I'm going to say a prayer at the close of the song for anybody that's gathered up here at the front. So first of all, just, Lord, I'm not even sure what it is you want to give me, but I'm willing to receive it. And if that's you this morning, then, then come. I'd love to pray for you. Because all we have to do is just say, Lord, I'm willing to receive the gift that you want to give me. Sometimes we're not willing to receive it because we're afraid of what he's wanting us to do with the gift. Don't let fear become a barrier. Just be willing to receive the gift. And then he's going to guide you and show you how he wants you to use it. But that's the next challenge then for us. What have you received from Christ that maybe you're not freely using and putting into practice? So I would invite you, if that's you, that you would pray and you'd ask Christ for courage and strength to do like what Megan did in leading the example and stepping out in faith, doing that thing that maybe scares you a little bit, but trust Christ to give you the power and the strength to do it because you will be blessed in so doing freely, we have received freely give. And of course, the greatest gift of all is the gift of forgiveness, the gift of salvation, a home in heaven. And if you're here this morning and you've not received that gift, it's not something you can earn, but it is something you must simply just receive. Christ offers it to you. And again, this morning during this time, if you'd like to come and pray and invite Christ into your life, receive that gift of forgiveness and grace. He offers it. Would you stand? Heavenly Father, now as we sing, as we get ready to close out our time together here, I thank you that your spirit goes with us. Thank you for your continuing work in the world. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we don't put into practice the things that you have given us so freely. And I pray that you'll use today to encourage us, make us aware, inspire us to receive what you want to give us and to freely share it with others as we proclaim the good news of your kingdom and what you offer to all of us in your name. Amen.